I have a bit of a love-hate relationship when it comes to Game Master's Guides, because some editions of Dungeons & Dragons do their Dungeon Master's Guide really well, like the 4th edition being one that I think every Game Master ever should read, and the 5th edition one really not being up to par. Although it has some stuff in there that comes really handy, and there's some stuff in there that's really good to know, and some reminders about to handle some certain players and some certain play styles and playing theater of the mind versus miniatures and all of that stuff. The amount of content in those books, in Game Master's Guides in general, that I can actually practically use in my games is just not enough to justify the price most of the time. And Cobalt Press, for some reason, took the chance to kickstart their own Game Master's Guide for Tales of the Valiant. And I got a copy, of course, and here are some of my first impressions. Hi there fellow role players and game masters, my name is Mr. Tarask and this is still your go-to YouTube channel for anything Tales of the Valiant and this is the Game Master's Guide for Tales of the Valiant, kickstarted by Cobalt Press, it was a successful kickstarter and everything. Now, I only got my hands on this PDF copy uh, for a few days now, I literally just asked Cobalt Press and they sent me this PDF copy, so everything I'm saying in this video is my early opinion, is my early impressions, it's not an all at all a review and I might change my mind on some as aspects of this, but I just wanted to like uh, show this to you and give you some of my early impressions, things that I've seen that I really, really like about it. Uh, um, so I have to admit, I was a little bit hesitant to start taking a look at this because I am not, I, I am not really the guy to do videos on game masters guides, and by that I mean I don't really generally like game masters guides. It all, always feels like that third book you get. You get the players' book, so you can get playing. You get the monsters' manual, so you have monsters to get like pit against your players, and then you get yourself a game masters guide for like some of those extra rules. And there's also a lot of stuff in there that feels a bit like fluff. Now it feels like fluff for somebody who's been playing the game for, I don't know, 22 or 23 years. Some of these things just feel a little bit like fluff, but for new Game Masters, Game Masters guys can actually be pretty damn good. Uh, the fifth edition one being the exception, I really don't like that book. I don't know why, but I don't really like it. But if you are looking for a channel that uh, compares 5th edition Wizards of the Coast stuff to other things, this is not your channel. I'm completely disconnected from Wizards of the Coast. I might mention them here and there, but I'm disconnected from Wizards of the Coast for my own reasons, and I just want to talk about Tales of Valiant, I want to talk about the Cypher system, and there I want to talk about like um, other RPG systems uh, that I want to talk about on my channel in the near future. Um, there's some more DC20 content coming and all that stuff. But anyway, Tales of the Valiant Game Master's Guide. Uh, this is the one, the third book in the Tales of the Valiant series, and it is really cool. So, what they do well here is a few things. I just want to use this video to go to a few things that I um, really, really like. Now, from the um, from the table of contents, we can already see there are some cool things like random encounter tables. Game Master needs that, right? Uh, random campaign dressing is a really cool part. Uh, fantasy inspiration is always in a Game Master's Guide, but mm, it's always like feels a little bit like, like filler, right? Homebrewer's Toolbox, um, uh, advanced social stuff, ad uh, adventuring options, advanced exploration stuff, all of that, uh, um, more in-depth rules for certain scenarios type thing. Now, if you know me, you know that I was hoping for more Doom rules. And guess what? There are more Doom rules uh, called Expanded Doom. Right here, there's a section on Expanded Doom. And I was really, really, really happy to see this section, but I'm always also a little bit like underwhelmed about the content of this section. Um, now, again, Cobalt Press, whatever. Um, I'm 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 going to be skeptical in a game master's guide thing situation. That's just the way I am. I I'm going to be skeptical. And Doom, I just expected more about Doom. I expected more from Doom because in the playtest material, people notice. People, I'm I'm gonna say it again. In the playtest material, there were these Doom rules that were infinitely more cool than what they are now. Now they're just like a generic set of rules. But in the early playtest material of uh, Project Black Flag, when it was still not uh, Tales of the Valley or whatever. Um, 
they had this situation where every monster had like like a lot of monsters not every monster but a lot of monsters had a doom point ability and on top of what you could do with the doom points that that i discuss in other videos as well you can also um um, use their doom point ability and expa ex uh, spend doom points for doing said ability. For example, a uh, red dragon having a breath weapon or something. I'm just from the top of my mind. It's probably not the way it was, but just like having a breath weapon. But having that breath weapon do something extra. I don't know, exploding or whatever. You could use your doom points for that. They took that out completely. Now monsters don't have a doom ability. Now doom points are just a generic rule. Doom is an optional rule introduced in the monster vault in which doom is resourced with an amount based on the encounter's challenge rating that you as a gm gain at the start of a combat encounter additional optional rules here expand on that giving options for you to increase the amount of doom you gain before um or during a combat encounter to increase uh bu -bu -bu -bu. Where are we? To increase the options available to you when you spend Doom to enhance a challenge of an encounter. So, all what this talks about is just like gaining more Doom points before an encounter. So, we know that with Doom points, uh, during an encounter, you can regain one expanded Doom for each of the following events. So, um, a Game Master can use Doom points... In order for the monster to do a few generic things, I don't know by the top of my hat what it is, but it's like uh, succeeding on a on a on a save, um, doing an extra attack if I'm not mistaken, and stuff like that. There's like four or five things you as a GM can do with Doom points you give yourself at the start of an encounter, depending on the challenge rating of that encounter. Normally, there's not a way to, there's no way to regain. Doom points during that encounter, uh, but you can, however, do that with these rules, and I find it interesting. It's interesting enough because they thought about some stuff that I didn't think about, but it just feels too generic for me. So, gaining doom before an encounter, you can increase the doom you gain at the start of a combat encounter by one for each of the following events that take place leading up to the encounter. Now, I may, I, I really like how much sense this makes. Hear me out. In the journey to the encounter, the PCs fail a check to disarm a trap by five or more. Um, this could lead up to the players making noise by setting off a trap or making noise trying to disarm the trap and the trap goes haywire or whatever that stuff. You need to, as a GM, tie a story to that. Don't just like have them fail at about five or more and then just like write down a do an extra doom point because then you're just using doom points as a way of doing math and, and stuff and you're not using doom points in order to tell a story. Use a game master should always end. They don't really go deep enough into that here. Um... To my opinion, because it's a Game Master's Guide, they should have gone deeper into that, right? You as a Game Master should say like, okay, you set up this trap, you fail uh, for five or more, so the trap goes all haywire and springs fall out and you make a lot of noise. Then it makes sense that the combat encounter with the final boss or the mid boss or whatever is in the dungeon is going to be harder. And they're going to that boss fight or that whatever fight is going to have an extra doom point at the start of the encounter. It makes sense. Second point, the PCs allow an ally of a creature in the encounter to escape and report to that creature. Same thing, makes sense. There is an ally, allied creature to the to the creature they're going to, going to fight. Maybe there's a kobold that is allied to the red dragon that they're going to fight and it goes to warn the red dragon like, hey, there's intruders here. Extra doom point, extra hard encounter. Uh, third point I make, the PCs finish a long rest despite the time-sensitive nature of the encounter or the build-up to it. The PCs must be aware that time is of the essence and make a conscious choice to take a long rest. Here they say that, like the PCs must be aware of that and they decide against that time pressure. It's an extra doom point. So they have to weigh that a little bit, give some extra element of like, we should rest but then the encounter gets harder, so we need to make sure we rest more than that the encounter gets harder, if that makes any sense. Um, so I like how that makes sense, the stuff that they say right here. But for a newer GM or a newer storyteller or whatever, 
it might be hard to tie a story to all of those aspects, if that makes any sense. This effect can't increase your starting doom for the encounter to more than double the st standard of the starting doom for an encounter of that tier. For example, when running a CR challenge rate of 0 to 4 encounter, you can never start with more than 2 doom, regardless of how many times uh, the PCs fail to disarm a trap in the monster's lair before the encounter. Makes sense. You don't want like 60 doom points at the start of an encounter, building up. Um, gaining doom during an encounter. During a combat encounter, you regain one expanded doom for each of the following events. A creature in the encounter fails an attack roll by five or more. I don't know how I would tie that in, but okay. A creature in the encounter suffers a critical hit. And then a creature in the encounter takes massive damage. I don't really know how that would translate into regaining doom. Um, if you have good ideas for that, make sure to comment it below. Again, first impressions video, uh, nothing really set in stone here, but comment that below. I really want to hear that because I can then use that, right? So, um, spending doom. When spending doom, you can choose one of the following options in addition to the options listed in the monster vault. This is where it gets a little bit interesting. Uh, so in the Monster Vault, you have like an auto save and you have like a critical hit or stuff like that. I don't know exactly. A creature automatically succeeds on a save in lieu of the, a die roll. This can be used only once per encounter. In lieu of a die roll, this can only be used. A creature automatically succeeds on an attack in lieu of a die roll. What is in lieu? What does in lieu mean? What, do, what does in lieu I'm sorry, my English isn't good enough for this. In... In... L... L... What the... L... I... E... U... In Lu. Meaning... Instead of... Oh, okay, just say it instead of. Uh, a creature automatically succeeds a save instead of a... That doesn't make... Automatically succeeds. So it's an auto succeed on a save, auto succeed on an attack, or a creature moves up to half its speed without provoking opportunities attack attacks. It can move this way only at the end of another creature's turn. Like that kind of stuff, I like that last bit. I like because that's like skirm. You give you give the creature skirmish options, like in the middle of like instead maybe you they're fighting a creature that doesn't have layer actions where it can move in between and and take actions in between players' turns. Uh, with this, it can move in between players' turns, making the um, yeah, making the combat a little more um um dynamic in that sense because i really like when combat is like the players act and then the monsters monster act and then player acts and the monster does some things which makes it really dynamic and realistic in a way although we're fighting dragons wizards it makes it more realistic another thing that caught my eye really quickly was injuries i always like injury systems and i have uh, reviewed some injury systems uh for from third party creators for fifth edition and i really like some of those things some of those systems go a little bit too far, some are a little bit more simple, and this one is really simple enough for you to add it quickly to your game. There's a bunch of things that I would change, like, for example, let's read it, damage typically has no other effect than a reduction in hit points. This optional rule adds the possibility for damage to also cause unique injuries. A creature might sustain an injury for one of the following reasons. Now, they call out some reasons here. I, as a game master, would not take all of these reasons, because damage then my game would really quickly turn into a shit show. But the great thing about a Game Master's Guide is that you can pick and choose your own thing. Um, Wolfgang Bauer himself sometimes says um, it's like an, a book, a D&D book, a 5th edition book, an RPG book. It's like an old car. You need to strip it for its parts and then build your own thing out of that, right? So... Um, Failing a death save by 5 or more, failing a save against a damaging effect by 5 or more, hit by a cold shot, uh, reduced by to 0 hit points if not kill, uh, but not killed from the damage, suffering a critical hit. Like, I'm not gonna give anybody an injury if every time a critical hit falls on the table. I mean, that, that's not just not gonna happen. Or taking massive amounts of damage. Uh, when creature sustains an injury, roll 1d20 and console the injury table. That's always interesting. So what I would do here personally is I would only do it if somebody w was reduced to zero hit points or take like 
half of their max hit points in damage from like one attack, right? Then I would be like, you're going to get injured. Um, only on those two occasions. Maybe every now and then I would be like, you know what? I'm going to roll a d6 and on a 5 and a 6, you are injured. I, I would do that. I might do that, but not suffering a critical hit. Not failing a death. Not failing a safe by 5 or more or a death save by 5 or more. That's just like, I don't know. That just it happens too often in the game, right? Um, and then there is an injury table. And I really, really, really like this injury table. Let me just quickly see if you guys can still see this. Yes you guys can still see this man i love this um so there's a d20 table and the more you go up the table which is really cool uh the 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 it's kind of like the other way around normally like when you roll a 20 20 it's really bad in this case um when you roll a 20 it's just a scar so when you roll an 18 to 20 it's a scar this minor cosmetic wound has little effect on a creature at the GM's discretion, the injured creature gains a bonus uh, of up to plus two on charisma, intimidation checks, or suffers a penalty of up to minus two on charisma persuasion checks when interacting with other creatures, depending on such a creature's reaction to scars and other obvious battle wounds. Magic such as a regenerate spell removes this injury. So basically, you become Anakin Skywalker and you become like just even more badass than you were before because you now have a scar, right? If you roll a 1 or a 2, it's an internal organ. This is really bad. An injury to a vital organ uh, makes it difficult to fully engage in combat. Whenever the injured creature attempts an action in combat, it must succeed on a DC 15 con save or lose its action. And it can't use reactions until the start of its next turn. Magic healing, which is fake, or spending 10 days doing nothing but resting removes the injury now whenever the injured creature attempts an action in combat it must succeed on a dc 15 con save or lose its action that is harsh that is really 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 harsh and there's like one chance out of 10 you're going to roll that right Magical healing removes the injury. Is that like one point of magical healing? Five points of magical healing is probably at the DM's discretion. I would say you need, need to at least do like five points because that's like a set of points that you also use to like remove minor effects and that stuff with like lay on hands and that stuff. Or is that 10 points? I would say five points. Uh, or spending 10 days doing nothing but resting. Uh, other stuff. Um, Injured creature has one fewer hand available to hold objects. A creature. So if you are sword and board fighter, good luck. Your sword or your board is going to go away. A creature reduced to no hands can no longer hold anything. No shit. Magic such as a regenerate spell restores uh, the lost appendages. It's just okay. Infection. The wound becomes septic. And until the injury is removed, the creature can't regain hit points except by magical means. So no second win and all that stuff. The injured creature's hit points maximum is reduced by one for every 24 hours the wound persists. If it is, if its hit point maximum is reduced to zero, it dies. So it doesn't do death saves. It dies, right? The infection is removed if the injured creature receives magical healing. Without magical healing, a creature can tend to the wound and make a DC 15 wisdom medicine check every 24 hours, preventing the hit blah, 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 reduction, blah, 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 blah. So this is a really cool thing to have in a Game Master's Guide. And again, some of this stuff that I'm talking about in my video might also be in the 5th edition guide. Might also be in the 4th edition guide. 3.5, 3.0, 2.0, 1.0, 1.0, 1.0, whatever. I'm just, I'm reviewing this book. I'm not reviewing all of the other stuff. I'm looking at this book. And I really like this really simple, pick what you want kind of injury system. The last thing that I want to talk about today before I go deeper in this book because I'm planning on doing more videos about this book is a downtime expanded uh, section uh, because I really liked the simplistic, easy to understand, quick to use uh, crafting rules in the uh, player's guide. I really like that they now also uh, in the Game Master's Guide have crafting uh, magic items and crafting uh, potions brewing and then there is another section, uh, scroll making. Now basically it's all the same stuff. It's 
It's just like all the same stuff, but it's more at the GM's discretion uh, than, than some of the other stuff. For example, players can now make uh, a magic item. For example, I don't know, a common magic item. What's a common magic item? I don't know. Is a potion of healing a common magic item? Let's say it's uncommon. Starting from PC level um, uh, fourth, they can make a uncommon magic item. A potion of healing might be common, but just as an example, um, a potion of healing, they can start creating from the PC level fourth. Uh, then at seventh, they can do a rare. At 12th, they can very rare. At 17th, they can legendary. And from the beginning, they can just do common magic items. Then if you go to the magic item rarity, it's just like, um, if you want to co uh, create a common magic item, it takes you one week. Uncommon, two weeks. Rare, 10. Very very rare, uh, 25. And legendary, 50 weeks. It's basically the same with potion brewing, although um, potion brewing it just goes a little bit more into like, uh, it's, it's it, you have to roll for it, right? A common is 1d4 days, 2d6 days, all of that stuff. Um and I like this system. I really like the system because it's really straightforward. It's like, what do you want to create? You want to create a magic item that is in the player's handbook? Yes, I want to create a magic item that is in the player's handbook, right? In the player's guide, sorry. Okay, what is its uh, rarity? Its rarity, it's... Uh, common. Okay, what level are you? I'm level 3, so I can create a common rarity magic item. Okay, sure, a common rarity magic item costs you one week to do. At the end of the week, you uh, make an ability check using intelligence as a default, but you can also, as a GM, at your discretion, use anything else, plus your arcana skill or relevant tool or whatever proficiency you have that makes sense for creating that. You do that roll. Uh, the result of this check determines the progress made toward crafting the magic item. Really simple. Um, you just roll that roll at the end of each week. So if you have a common magic item, you need you roll that roll uh, after the first week. If you have a 1 to 10, pay a portion of the magic item's total cost to cover wasted material or lose one week of progr progress towards creating the uh, item. So um, 11 to 15 is make one week of progress towards creating the item. So if you roll an 11 to 15, you have created a common item, right? If you roll a 16 to 20, it's make two weeks of progress. So you're going double the speed for that week, right? So you, so uh, for example, if you have a legendary magic item that you want to create at 17th level, right? You have 50 weeks. You roll first. You roll a, uh, you roll a, a 12 which gives you one week of progress, okay, 49 weeks to go. Then you roll a 17, that's two weeks of progress, okay, a 47 weeks to go, you just deduct that. I really like the simplicity of the system. I really like how this is just, uh, there's also scrolls, by the way, uh, you can create magical scrolls for uh, different spells. A PC can create a spell scroll if of any spell the PC knows or can prepare. If the spell is innate, known, not granted by class feature, uh, as if, through a lineage feature, the spell can be scribed only at the lowest possible circle. In addition, if the spell is a cantrip, the re resulting scroll is always cast as if the caster was first level. You can just create a spell scroll um, for like, maybe you want to give a fireball. Is that a fourth level spell, a fireball? I don't know. To one of your friends. You're like, Here's a fire scroll spell. You need to pay 350 gold pieces for the materials to uh, create that scroll. And you need 2d12 days in order to do that. That is it. Uh, they talk about like the time and um, uh, what uh, tools you need for that. And I really like that the Game Master's Guide uh, by Cobalt Press goes deeper into that portion of uh, the game because I often have a lot of players that in all of my RPGs games there's always like one player sooner or later who is like I want to start creating some stuff that maybe they're on a ship and they're going from A to B and it takes like five weeks and I ask them what do you do in those weeks and one of the people is like I want to create potions um, um, and oftentimes I need to or I need to wing it and just come up with rules on the fly or I use a system that often feels a little bit too much and there's just too much thought put in it and it's almost a game within the game and you're playing a separate game just for creating stuff and crafting stuff that just don't doesn't feel heroic it doesn't feel like the game flows and this system really is like you do one or three or four you just do a few rolls and bam that's it you know what you have and you can 
role-playing and playing Tales of the Valiant, basically. And that's it for today when it comes to the Game Master's Guide for Tales of the Valiant. Now, I want to do a video series on this book uh, because there's a lot, a lot, a lot in this book to get into. And these are just my early impressions. And at the end, I want to do a full review with the physical in my hands and all of that stuff. Um, but... You Everybody knows by now that when it comes to Game Master's Guides, I'm going to be skeptical and there's some stuff that I'm going to say like I like a little bit less. Overall, I think Cobalt Press is doing a really good job with this book and I just can't wait to do a few more videos of it. If you want to get it for yourself, link in the description below. I get a small percentage of that if you do that. And until next video, bye-bye.